is Noreen Svanda. I'm a registered professional psychologist. I am the executive director of the Alberta Black Therapist Network. I am a therapist. So I work with people from all different walks of life, from uh, children, couples, individuals, families, and helping them heal through the lenses of being strength focused and really wanting people to find the healing within themselves. So the Alberta Black Therapist is a network of therapists that identify as black. So working within the network allows us as black therapists to not feel isolated. And that's where the network was really founded. You work in the mental health field, which is well predominantly white and kept uh, that way for a particular reason because healing was always meant for the black from the white perspective so having black people in that space allows us to offer a different perspective and we came together to say we have the skills the strengths to heal our own people and because we have an understanding of them so we started out as a network of let's get together to learn about each other so we can refer clients and then it turned into a non-profit organization because we realized the public needs to know how to access us, needs to have an avenue to get a hold of us that isn't finding us individually but having a network of individuals that they can choose from. Our Better Black Therapist Network is the first of its kind in terms of having individuals that all work within the mental health coming together to collaborate and we're not only the first in Alberta but we're the first in the Paris and I haven't seen anything like it in Ontario or anywhere else most likely it is from a medical standpoint whereas our group focuses on supporting mental health and psychological support there is black people in the world <laughs> it makes sense for the help to be offered by individuals that look like them they have the same lived experience but also are able to understand why they are seeking support right now the history of black people accessing well any medical support isn't great because that has a history of either being used for experiments without truly consenting to them or being aware of what you receive. So when you are seeking support and you have someone that looks like you, you know that you are getting support that they would be willing to receive themselves. So there's that trust already in place, but also it makes it a little easy to build the relationship. You don't have to spend time retelling some of the stories because we understand and we speak. It doesn't have to be the exact same language, but it's the same culture behind it. Mental health is something that the black community has really stigmatized for the longest of time where individuals don't access supports. That means if you experience a mental health illness, you are your illness. So people really shy away from accessing supports. So what ends up happening is individuals do it in silence or in isolation. So it becomes more important for people to have the dialogues about mental health become normalized. And the shift is starting to happen when people realize that they are not alone in this. And that just because you experience a mental illness, you are not your illness. You don't have to be uh, your illness that we take you and we throw you to the edge of the society. You can still function as part of society even when you experience a mental illness. Black lives have always mattered and that has been a conversation that needed to be highlighted at a different scale. And that means recognizing that the black experience is valid. That includes their mental health. Certain experiences tend to overshadow when we talk about what is it like to be a racialized race? And it is, well, we are black, indigenous, and people of color. That isn't really highlighting the black experience. That's simply saying, yeah, these experiences that are different from the Caucasian or the main, the majority experiences. In reality, the black experience is in its own. And that means the experiences of mental health are also unique. And having the black, Alberta Black Therapist Network 
be available during that time created a space for people not only to talk about how this is impacting them mentally but recognizing that these services need to be in place even before we have such incidents so that we can start to educate the public about what it is that we need to have in place for us to feel accomplished but also part of the world and citizens that can contribute if you have a black doctor a black therapist a black teacher you are less likely to, to assume that that black individual on in the street is a gangster or is someone that is a danger to you because you can actually normalize that my therapist is black my doctor is black so just because some an individual is black and wearing a hoodie doesn't mean they are going to be a danger to me because this is someone that I can access for help as well and this is a little secret that most likely other therapists would not say you I am as nervous as you are when we're meeting for the first time I'm meeting someone new so why wouldn't it be right so don't go in there assuming that your therapist is going to analyze you your therapist is there to support you and join you in your journey so therapy is the same way that we go and learn how to drive you're going to learn how to look at your life in a different way you are allowing someone to help you unpack some of your experiences so therapy is not the same as having a conversation with a friend because a friend is well invested in one outcome or the other as a therapist i'm not invested in you doing one thing but i'm invested in you finding yourself and allowing you to evolve if you come today and you say i don't want to do what we discussed that's perfectly fine right so i'm not the expert you are i'm just there to help you support you in the journey that you're going through um, hi my name is Khalid Hashi and i'm the founder and ceo of Ago EMR uh, an award-winning provider of digital health solutions and redesign uh, mobile health solutions to frontline workers caregivers organizations um, and governments uh, across Somalia. So, Ago EMR actually means to know in the Somali language and the idea and the concept was inspired by my first-hand encounter navigating the health systems in Somalia. I was accompanying my grandmother during her medical practice and I soon realized that her medical records uh, weren't kept on file and that sparked an idea to innovate. Now, OGO is supporting frontline workers with contextualized mobile health solutions um, to those on the front lines um, in an effort to support them in their everyday work and make life easier for them. But it also supports caregivers by providing access to equitable health care and informing them of where and when to go for services. In, in December, we got word that we were selected as a semi-finalist for the Global Citizen Cisco uh, youth Leadership Award, and that's uh, a very competitive process where thousands of innovators and countries have participated in. And we're very thankful and fortunate to have been selected as a top, top eight. Somalia is a country emerging from many years of conflict, and we're finally at a time now where things are getting better. Um, and we know that innovation and technology can play um, a big role in, in helping Somalia work towards the sustainable development goals. and. We're happy to be doing our part in supporting local efforts um, on, that, on that front. For me, going to Somalia uh, was an opportunity for me to meet my grandmother. You know, never in a million years that I think I'd <laughs> start innovating. I don't have a background in medicine or in technology, but I knew that I had a passion to, to do something and I could amplify the voices of, of, of people on the ground. I knew that there was something that could have been, I knew something had to be done and I knew there was easier ways of doing it. So the idea actually initially started off as a, a crowd uh, GoFundMe campaign and I just reached out to my local community um, to help me fundraise enough money to create a prototype just to support that one clinic. And today we're supporting thousands of uh, patients across the country, working with government and leading organizations like World Vision um, and the Response Innovation Lab. The challenge uh, connected us to an ecosystem of public health experts and organizations and allowed for us to take that idea and design it in a way that can have long-term sustainable impact, not just in Somalia, but in neighboring countries as well. Um, and today we're supporting the national COVID-19 effort through the provision of our mobile health application, 
we're creating videos uh, on prevention uh, of COVID, and those videos have been approved by the Federal Ministry of Health, endorsed by the United Nations, and have scaled across 45 villages over four regions, and have targeted over 80,000 pastoralists in rural communities. The demand actually just uh, increased by a thousand. Like we're getting demo requests now all across the country, and people are asking us, you know, how we can further support on the COVID-19 effort. Um, and we're glad to be in a position to, to um, continue to improve our, our system to support Somalia and other parts of the healthcare sector. There is a lack of contextualized, uh, one, solutions for frontline workers, but also two, uh, public health information. We were actually one of the first actors, if not the first, that started creating these uh, videos uh, through our mobile health application to support our frontline workers. So when we were, when I was actually on the ground, when I was talking to frontline workers, talking about COVID, a lot of people uh, quite didn't understand uh, the severity of it. So I introduced the video just within one clinic as a training method, and then that video scaled across the country now and actually made its way to Yemen. So we're working with Save the Children um, to further contextualize that content to support Yemen's response. So we've developed these videos now in Arabic and the impact has reached uh, across not only across Somalia, but um, went into Yemen, which is something I'm very proud of. The local community here in Edmonton helped create the idea. Like I developed everything from scratch, really. Like, like even our logo, I first started doing it on Canva. Like I didn't think this would be like a leading provider of digital health solutions. It was a passion project. Um, and I really had no expectations. And I remember just going on Instagram and asking, my friends and family and just said, you know, I need to raise this money. Like it, it's pressing, I need it now. This is a story. And within a span of two weeks, we raised uh, close to $10,000 just on Instagram. Just said for me, I went there to, to visit my only living grandparent. I didn't have an opportunity to meet any, um, any of my grandparents prior to that point. So I went there just to help my grandmother navigate the health system mm -hmm. and, and to meet her. I just, that was my only wish was to, to meet her. And I think that translated and transpired to be what, what it is. So I think just be cautious um, and curious, have a curious mind, uh, go travel, travel anywhere. Um, and you learn so much and, and then you can find out if there are any needs um, and see if you'd be the right person to, 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 to support on that front. And if you're not, to reach out to the people or amplify the voices of people who, who are doing that work. My name is Dorje, the singing shaman, and I am simply looking to experience sharing my music and my healing and medicine with as many people as possible. service practicing shaman here in the city of Edmonton. Uh, I've been running my shamanic practice for about seven or eight years and as long along with that I am a singer and songwriter in particular country music. I have been featured multiple times in publications like uh, Country Queer. I was featured in the Edmonton Journal just a couple weeks ago. I was like front page of the art section and also on the front page. Uh, I recently did an interview with CBC Edmonton AM. A Proud Radio on Apple Music uh, featured me as a Rainbow Artist of the Month for January. So uh, yeah, my interview and my music was broadcast to over 165 countries. And uh, also I was featured on Color Me Country, also on Apple Music uh, with Reese Palmer. New Kind of Outlaw was a featured song. Tell me why we have been outlawed Different standards for our girl Mickey Only choice to be is an outlaw uh, Well, I uh, grew up here in Alberta, in small town Alberta um, and uh, I just grew up with country music in my family. Uh, my family are farmers and uh, yeah, country music was a big part of our upbringing. The storytelling element uh, always really spoke to me. Also the imagery that I feel country music allows for to come across within the lyrical content as well. Uh, my grandmother in particular was an incredible instrumentalist. Uh, she played piano, banjo, guitar, 
uh, push, in, push organ, harmonica, and also she had seven siblings and they sang in a lot of choirs and bands. Um, they were really well known for their seven part harmonies that they were able to create. So yeah, I was always around music. Um, it took me a long time to build up the confidence to uh, feel like I could be a professional musician and performer, um, but I've always been a creator of some sort or drawn to the creative arts. Shout out to Lila Montero, Valerie June, Annette Donna's Missy Ruby, Donna Mason, Tyler B, and our love. Country music actually all originates from black folks. Uh, so there's definitely that element as well that I connect with more so now uh, as an adult um, and as someone who is consciously trying to heal from the racial traumas that I've experienced in my life. Um, it's, it's really, really important for me to contribute to the legacy of black people's oppression um, by bringing more, I guess, education to this genre of music. I think there's two different ways to look at it. There are actually a lot of black folks doing country music, creating country music, um, and also to like a lot of queer folk creating country music. However, the opportunities and the platforms aren't really there. Um, we are seeing a pretty drastic shift over this last year. There was a song data report created around mainstream radio airplay and less than 5% of the artists being played in country music were BIPOC, um, even less underneath 1% uh, for the LGBTQ2S plus community. Uh, so there's a long ways to go. I, I feel in particular for black people, um, you know, we need more than one seat at the table of this genre of music, multiple seats at the table. And it's not about white folks or the gatekeepers of country music to offer those, those seats, they're, they're ours. So I think it's more about that aspect of just like claiming what is already ours and just letting people know that we are here. I feel like Edmonton is so conducive to the arts in general. Um, from the time I started performing professionally uh, back in 2018, uh, pretty much from the get-go, I have had people coming to my shows, um, filling up the rooms, and um, yeah, I, I feel like I've been very, very blessed with that. Like, this is an arts city. This is a city of creators um, and a city of supporters of the arts. Um, so I feel really blessed to be here. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in terms of grants and funding just here locally in our city that if you even think about globally isn't the norm. Um, just even chatting with some fellow musicians down who live down in Nashville, which is the country mecca, um, you know, they don't have the same opportunities or support that we get uh, locally, provincially, and federally as artists and creators. So I just want to put forward that I am proud and grateful to be uh, settled here on Treaty 6 land and um, to represent my friends and family and myself uh, within the genre of music. And um, yeah, again, just creating opportunities for more diversity and inclusion in, in country music. I'm Mariam Tsegai, and I'm winner of the 2020 Breakthrough Junior Challenge. You know, I just want to let you know, Mariam, you are the winner for oh this year's Breakthrough Junior Challenge, the $250,000 scholarship, the $100,000 science lab for your school, the $50,000 uh, for your uh, teacher. They are yours. Congratulations. This is an absolutely <laughs> life-changing moment. The Breakthrough Junior Challenge is a science competition, a science video competition for uh, youth around the world um, from ages 13 to 18 to make a video about a complex topic in math or science. And yeah, it gets you to think creatively about explaining science. So I found about about the challenge five years ago, but I never participated until this year. And um, 
I knew I always wanted to take it or wanted to take part in the challenge because I wanted to do science, I want to do science communication, but like, you know, I didn't really know how to take those steps in, in the future, but I, this, I knew this challenge was there and I knew like, I already like making videos and stuff. So it was just really tuned to what I like doing. Um, so I decided to take part this year because we were in the middle of a pandemic and I didn't have exams or anything at the time. So I decided to use my time to uh, take part in the challenge. I came across this video that was talking about entropy and it very, 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 very briefly just said something about quantum tunneling, like, oh, the universe will do this and then something will quantum tunnel and then something will restart. And I thought, wait, what is quantum tunneling? I don't, I've never heard of this. And um, before that, I was watching some videos about quantum physics, just like coincidentally, because I was getting interested by it a few months before that. Um, and quantum tunneling is just something I haven't heard of from all the other quantum phenomena uh, I watched and read about. So I wanted, I immediately wanted to know what it was about. And I kept uh, researching and like slowly my research shifted from entropy to quantum tunneling. And then I thought about like, I thought that I could tell a better story with quantum tunneling than entropy. And I was definitely a lot more enthusiastic about explaining that topic instead of entropy. I, I knew that like the topic I picked was really advanced. Like even if you have a uh, high school science, a background in like high school science and physics, it's still like senior level university physics. So um, I knew that I couldn't like speak down to you or like lecture the viewer because you needed to I needed to be like at the level of the viewer and um explain things only assuming that you know one thing and that everything's made of atoms or you know what an atom is so I assumed that the viewer only knew that and just went off from there and made sure I didn't use <laughs> it's kind of it seems a little ironic but I avoid scientific vocabulary in a science video, I avoided almost all math as much as possible in a science video to explain it. Um, because I feel like people immediately disengage or feel intimidated when they see, um, especially science related things, because there's like this stigma or like idea that like science, science is like elitist and only professionals can understand this. And it's like above you, so don't, you know? So I, wanted to have a different approach and one have an approach that would engage anyone and keep your attention and you know help you realize that it is a fun topic still you know it doesn't need to be it's so serious and so uh dry i think it definitely uh encourages people uh especially like young girls of color to see um, someone who looks like them or someone who like represents them in a stage like this or in a world stage, um, especially in a field where they're severely underrepresented because it just like materializes that reality that you like, you know, when you see yourself, when you see someone who looks like you in that position, it just makes it more real for you. Um, and I, someone told me recently, but there was this study done where they um, showed like a video about computer science to like kids in a classroom. And um, there were like, you know, like normal levels of engagement, but when they showed a video of computer science with girls in it, like the girls were a lot more engaged and more enthusiastic, more curious about computer science. So um, yeah, having, having uh seeing someone in that position definitely changes a lot when i was thinking about the uh taking the breakthrough junior challenge and you know i've known about it like i said for a few years but never did it uh one of the reasons that i didn't do it you know other than exams was that a lot of the videos were really high-end like high production quality videos and i thought like dang like i don't have those professional software or um tools so you know if you feel like that about a competition or something else that you want to take a part of take part in just 
like really use what you have because I mean I didn't go out of my way with like trying to get new things um to make my video I just like used what I had on um <laughs> very basic things like google slides to make my animations so um don't feel like you can't take a part in something because you don't have the fancy excessive gadgets or whatnot Uh, my name is Sarah Catherine. I'm 12 years old and I'm in grade 7 at Stratford School. Uh, well, I read a lot of comic books when I was small and then I said, uh, no, and then I thought that I wanted to do the same things that the people who wrote the comic books did. So I started uh, watching uh, I mean, examining the comic book drawings and doing them myself, and then I tried to do my own. I was really excited because uh, I started reading Harry, the Harry Potter books in the summer because I was wondering like uh, why everyone loved them so much, and then I happened to find them at my dad's school because he's a teacher, so he let me borrow the first book and I came to read it at home, and I really liked it, and I showed it to my little sister, and she did too, and I was like, oh, that's why everyone likes Harry Potter so much. And then I kept reading uh, the other books, but it's kind of been hard to access them because it's the libraries are closed and stuff like that. But my mom knows this WhatsApp group with a lot of other Africans from uh, our country, and uh, one of them posted a link because he knows that I like art. So my mom showed it to me and she told me, asked me if I wanted to do it, and I said yeah, so uh, we just did the competition. Uh, I drew a king in a portrait with two of the children from his kingdom looking at him and I decided to do the king in a portrait because most other people just drew the king himself somewhere so I decided I would make it a little different. Uh, well my mom got a phone call and they were telling her that she had to reply to an email that she had gotten and she thought it had been like spamming so she hadn't uh, watched it so uh, after she got the phone call she decided she'd just uh, go and look at it to check and she did she was like oh that was the competition we did like a month ago and then she told me and i was really excited and i was running around the house uh yeah i think um i might be an inspiration to some people to uh make their art not always the same as other people's and at least give it a bit of a twist add as much of your own ideas as possible inside uh, one of any of your drawings